uh, the good news, the better news is next Sunday you'll have a real preacher and that will work quite well. So anyway, but I do appreciate the opportunity. <laughs> Just getting ready to initiate excommunication in, in a church like this. So. How many of you have a nickname or have had a nickname in the past? Yeah, several. I, I've had a couple. Uh, when I was a kid, they called me Bird because I was skinny and had bird legs. The same height as I am now, but uh, uh, that was about 80 pounds ago. They, they said that I had to tie my legs in, in knots in order to have knees. That was how skinny I was. Uh, when I got to college teaching, uh, the school uh, newspaper cartoonist, one of the students, gave me the nickname of Dr. Slayer. It was kind of a play on my name Sladen. And he ran this series of cartoons where Dr. Slayer was in combat with Homework Man. And the students loved it. They, they would go to chapel on uh, the uh, Wednesday to get the newspaper afterwards rather than to hear the chapel sermon, I think. But anyway, uh, I had nicknames growing up. And nicknames are good. And the person I'm going to talk about today is a fellow named Joseph the Levite. And how many of you have, have heard about Joseph the Levite prior to the reading of the scripture this morning? Yeah, we have a couple. Good. Uh, actually, we know him by his nickname, which was given to him by the apostles, and it was Barnabas, and it means son of encouragement. And I don't believe that there's any character in the New Testament <clears throat> that is more appropriately nicknamed than Barnabas. Uh, it really describes who he is. And so I want to talk about Barnabas this morning, give you a little bit of background, debate a little bit about his conversion, and then a few of his qualities or characteristics and what that means to you and to me here in the 21st century. <clears throat> Barnabas came from the island of Cyprus. Uh, and uh, I don't know whether he was living in Jerusalem at this time uh, of the reading of the scripture that we mentioned this morning or whether uh, he was visiting there. Uh, and, and that's really probably not that important to the story. Living on Cyprus, we know that he was Jewish, and therefore he would have been what is called a Hellenistic Jew, or a Jew of the Diaspora, the Dispersion, those Jews outside of Palestine. Now the Jews in Palestine were called Hebraists, and the Hebraists were very conservative in their approach toward religion, in their approach toward culture. They uh, held to what is called the Hebrew canon, or the 39 books that we have and, and hold to in, in, the, in, I would say, the Protestant canon. Uh, and actually they only had 24. They were the same books that we have, but there were only 24 because they counted 1st and 2nd Chronicles and 1st and 2nd Samuels and 1st and 2nd Kings as simply one book. They were divided into two because they wouldn't fit on one scroll uh, in those days. Uh, and then, of course, the, the twelve minor prophets, they called them the twelve and counted it as one book. So it was a different numbering, but it was kind of the same. The Hellenistic Jews probably used what is called the Septuagint, a Greek translation of the Hebrew Bible. And not only did the Septuagint have these 39 books that we hold to, they added 15 more that we call the Apocrypha. And I'm sure that maybe not all held to this, but anyway, that was one of the things. And the Septuagint uh, arose in the 3rd and the 2nd century B.C. Somewhere in there, the tradition was that 70 or 72 Jewish scholars, separate from one another, came up with identical translations. Uh, it was a tradition. But I think at the same time, when uh, we look at this, this was probably a reflection of the Hebrew culture, I mean the, the Greek culture upon uh, the Jews outside of Palestine. Uh, there may have been three and a half million Jews uh, out there in the Roman world and maybe five to six hundred thousand in Palestine. Another aspect in comparing uh, the two groups, the, the, the Palestinian Jews, uh, their central in institution was the temple. And the Levites often would come, there would be Levites who would assist the priest in, in, the, in the temple and in temple worship. The synagogue was most important for the, the uh, Hellenistic Jews. Uh, it was their place not only of worship, it was a place of education as well for the young people. And the Hellenistic Jews, I think, were much more open to new ideas and new ways and new experiments of doing things. And not that they, they weren't open, uh, I guess, among some of the Hebraists, but uh, they were much more open. You know, they, con they had contact with Gentiles on a regular basis. Uh, they had new ideas. The, the influence of Greek philosophy was out there and, and the new ways of doing things. 
And so Barnabas, I think, is one of those who is very open to new possibilities. I think it's one of the reasons it was so easy for him to become a believer. <clears throat> One other aspect about Barnabas, he was probably well-to-do. A couple of things indicate this. One, he has a piece of land in Jerusalem that he sells and the money is, is used to help the poor and the needy and the widows. And, and another thing is he did a lot of traveling and, and traveling, you know, is kind of expensive. Uh, and, and it may be that his job, his profession, uh, enabled him to do so. Maybe he was kind of a businessman or a salesman, we don't know. But it seems that he was probably well-to-do. His sister, or possibly sister-in-law, had a big house in Jerusalem, and maybe it was a part of family wealth that was there. But his, this is the kind of guy that we know about in terms of his background. <clears throat> now, what do we know about his conversion? In terms of what we have in the scriptures, we don't know anything about his conversion. But as Daryl knows, that never stops a preacher from speculating on, on what it might, happen, might have happened, and I, I, I'm going to do that this morning. I think there are two possibilities. One possibility <clears throat> is that there was an influence in the early church and he may have either heard Jesus teach and preach or at least been influenced by his sister who we know is a Christian. She had a, this large home, uh, her name was Mary, and it was a place where the apostles would gather together and I think also a place possibly where Jesus with his apostles in that last week may have gathered together as well. And so she may have had an influence upon him there. Uh, and so, uh, if he was visiting, he could have been at the home uh, of his sister uh, when Jesus and his apostles gathered together, and he could have heard, heard Jesus and been influenced by that. Or at least uh, <clears throat> later on, uh, he had the influence of the apostles. Uh, I was sitting in my recliner, my home within my home last night, and going over my sermon, and I had a new thought I'd never had before, which is uh, not unusual in this day and time. And I think that it's quite possible that the evidence points toward uh, uh, Barnabas being there and maybe having heard Jesus in his sister's home. I came to the conclusion that it's possible that the place for the Last Supper may have been Mary's home. And I, the evidence is not totally clear, but as I went back and I read these stories uh, from the Gospel of Mark and then also Matthew and Luke, it seemed like that uh, this is a possibility. You remember the story where Jesus told his, uh, a couple of his apostles to go and find this man who had, was carrying a, a jar of water and follow to his home and then go in and ask the owner of the home about the guest room that, that Jesus could use for the Passover. <clears throat> and that may have been the home of Mary. Uh, it's possible in the interpretation, I think, of Mark and Luke Matthew seems to indicate a masculine owner, but I think even that is open to, to interpretation. But the reason I think that it might have been Mary's home is because in the Gospel of Mark, there's a story that you don't find in any other Gospel in the Garden of Gethsemane. You know Gethsemane, where Jesus is arrested and you have chaos that takes place. And there's a young man there, and all he is wrapped in is in a sheet. He doesn't have any clothes on. And a guard reaches out to grab him, and he grabs the sheet, and he goes streaking off and into the, into the night. It's the first streaker in the New Testament, I used to tell my students just before they booed loudly at me. But anyway, uh, it seems to me that this was Mark. Why else would it be there in that one gospel? And that Mark may have had a way of saying, look, you know, I was there, and I saw all of this. Uh, it's the only place it's found, and that's the only explanation that I really have. If that's the case that he may have followed Jesus and the apostles after the Last Supper from his home. Should have been in bed, but he wanted to see what was going on. And lo and behold, there he is and he's watching what's happening. That's a possibility. I won't say it's the absolute truth this morning. But I find it kind of amazing. And this story may, may at least give a little light there. So that's one possibility. The other possibility is that Barnabas may have been converted at Pentecost. You know. There were people from all over at Pentecost, the outpouring of the Spirit, and Peter preaching. And we're told of all these different places. Now, Cyprus is not mentioned, but Crete is mentioned, which is a nearby island. And so it may have been that he was there, and he heard the message, and he heard Peter proclaiming that Jesus was the, the Messiah. Uh, and uh, he therefore began to think about this and wound up becoming a believer and may have been baptized into the church. We don't know with any certainty how he was converted, but these seem to be two possibilities as I look through this material. <clears throat> One thing I do think is that the conversion from being a, a Levite and, and a Jew into becoming a Levite and a Jew who happened to also become a Christian 
was that it seemed like a very smooth transition for Barnabas, not like the case of the Damascus Road experience I'll mention in just a few moments concerning Paul. But it seemed like it was a smooth transition. Who he was before, in a lot of ways, was who he was afterwards, except now he was a follower of Jesus and believed that Jesus was the Messiah. Uh, because uh, he was a very calm, I think, uh, uh, even keel person in his demeanor and life from everything that we can glean from the scriptures on that. Now, what about Barnabas? I think there are uh, a few qualities uh, that uh, you can say about him. And one was that I think he, more than theology, he lived out his faith. He was not necessarily a great theologian. We don't know. There's nothing mentioned about his theology. But we do know who he was by what he did. And whatever he believed, that was affirmed and uh, uh, reaffirmed by the way that he conducted himself in relationship to others, in relationship to the world, in relationship to the church. We know him. We know what he believes in a sense by the way that he lives his life. And I think that was important. And, and a lot of Christians are like that. I like theological debate. But I also like uh, to, to look at people and starting with myself and seeing the witness that we give by the way that we live. I think that's so important. And, and Barnabas is a great example of this. And the second really important thing about Barnabas, and this is the lesson for this morning, he saw the good in people. It's easy to see the shortcomings and the failures. You can probably go uh, out after church today, go to, to dinner, and you start talking about the preacher and his sermon, you know, and you think about the bad points and how I fouled up, you know, how did he do today, or how didn't he do, you know, and there's a lot more to worship than, than how the preacher did on any given Sunday. But when you look at him, he had this uh, wonderful ability to see people in a very, very positive sense. The first story we have about him, there was need in the church, that early Christian fellowship in the community. They didn't even call it a church in those days. And there was need. There were the poor. There were the needy. There were the widows. And in the good Jewish tradition, uh, the, the fellowship took care of them. And he was one of those. And I think he may have been the first, even though it says that many sold property. His name is the one that's mentioned. And Barnabas, or Joseph the Levite sold a piece of property and took it and gave it to the apostles to distribute and to help the poor. He didn't look at the poor and say, well, these people are lazy and they don't work or, you know, uh, if they had eaten better, you know, they wouldn't have the health problems that they're having today or whatever you want to explain away, you know, for not giving. He looked at them and he saw the need. Remember last Sunday, if you were here, we talked about the Good Samaritan. The lawyer asked the question, who is my neighbor? Jesus told the story of the Good Samaritan and rephrased the question and said, who proved to be the neighbor? Barnabas was neighborly. Barnabas was caring. And he reached out to help the people that had a need rather than to try to evaluate how they got in the condition that they were in. Another good example of his encouraging aspect had to do with Saul, who's later called Paul. We'll talk about that in just a moment. Here is Saul. He's in Jerusalem at a time when the first Christian martyr uh, shows up, and that's Stephen. And he's stoned to death, and Saul is there, and Saul is, a, is an intellect. Saul is a Jewish philosopher in a lot of ways, and he looked at the law, and the law was God's great revelation, and you didn't need anything more. And he looked at these Christians, these followers of Jesus, and he was convinced, you know, that it's intolerable for these fishermen and tax collectors to claim that they've had a revelation from God. And so he goes and he gets the authority to go into the homes uh, in Jerusalem to find Christians, to arrest them, to bring them out and be brought before the authorities to be tried and many of them to put into prison. And he's so good at being this grand inquisitor, when he runs out of people in Jerusalem, he asks for permission to go to Damascus, <clears throat> where there was a large group of people, of, of believers. And he gets permission and he goes and he's going to do the same thing there, except he has this blinding vision on the road to Damascus in which the resurrected Jesus appears to him and says, Saul, why do you persecute me? And he has a turnabout. He has 180 degrees. His conversion was not like that of Barnabas. It wasn't smooth and easy. It was 180 degrees, a radical turnabout. He goes on into Damascus, if you remember the story, and there, uh, you know, he has temporary blindness. He goes away. He begins to preach and proclaim Christ, and he gets into trouble. The persecuted, the persecutor becomes the persecuted. And lo and behold, they lower him over the wall in a basket so he can escape the city to go back to Jerusalem. 
He's the first basket case in the New Testament. You're getting a lot of firsts this morning. He goes back to Jerusalem and the apostles see him and receive him with open arms? No. Aren't you the guy that was going into our homes and arresting people? Aren't you the guy that caused so much pain and so much agony among our fellowship? But there was one guy there, Barnabas, and he talked with Saul. And he became convinced that Saul, you know, was one who was a, a worthy individual, who had had this experience that he talked about. And he supported him, and he vouched for him. He encouraged Saul, and he encouraged the rest of the, uh, of the leadership in that church to accept Saul. <clears throat> Years later, Barnabas is at Antioch, leading in the church there. And he invites Saul to come and to help him in the church. And it's not too long before that church, under the leadership of the Spirit, decides to send out a couple of missionaries. And who do they send out? They send out uh, Barnabas, and they send out Saul. And a young, another fellow comes into play, John Mark, who, who joins him on this journey. And when we look at this, then Saul becomes this, this great leader in the church. <clears throat> and I think he does so because of the encouragement and the support of a fellow by the name of Barnabas who saw not only good but he saw potential in this individual and I think that was important to Saul in his journey John Mark is, is, is another individual his mother uh, was either the sister I think or the sister-in-law although in Colossians it mentions Mark as a cousin uh, I don't want to get through the family tree tough. I, I, I've done my own and I'm my own cousin on both sides of my family. So uh, <clears throat> I'm not sure how that all sorts out in the New Testament either, but I know it can happen. But anyway, <clears throat> here's John Mark. And he's a young man. He was there in those early days, in that last week uh, of Jesus and his crucifixion and his uh, resurrection and his ascension. And uh, the stage in the growth of the early church. But he is invited to go along with Barnabas and Saul. And they go to the island of Cyprus. And they work their way across the island. And here's an opportunity to work with these two great leaders in the church. But as they begin to depart across the Mediterranean Sea to, to uh, Asia and to the province of Asia Minor, Barnabas and Saul, they cross the sea, but John Mark goes home. We don't know why. He may have been tired, he may have been bored, he may have been afraid because it was kind of a dangerous area they're going to. But he goes home, he leaves the party. And two things happen. One, Luke changes the order of the missionaries. And for Luke, order was very important. It has been Barnabas and his company, Barnabas and Saul. But now it becomes Paul and Barnabas. Paul and his company. And Paul's name is changed from Saul to Paul. And I think these changes indicate a change in leadership. I think that was important. To Luke. Uh, a good example is Priscilla and Aquila. Priscilla is always mentioned first, which was highly uncommon, but she was an important worker, important Christian worker, and I think she had a, a, a level above uh, even, even her husband. And so you have the change of the name which indicates change of leadership, and it does take place. When they go over, Paul realizes that the Gentiles are responding directly to the preaching on Jesus and he decides to go directly to them rather than starting in the synagogue and, and those that were there who were interested in it. And so a major step takes place in the church, direct preaching to the Gentiles. Now, one other aspect about this is that when they, they go back to Antioch and they report all that's going on in the church, uh, in, in, in the mission work, they report that. Uh, they're, they're proclaiming, look, the Gentiles are responding. And this is something new, and it's something pretty radical for Jewish Christianity. Because, you know, I think up until this time, the idea was that Christianity is one of those sects of Judaism, kind of like the Sadducees and the Pharisees and the Essenes and the Zealots. But they go back to Jerusalem, and Luke once again changes the order, and I think it's because of the respect for Barnabas. It becomes Barnabas and Paul. Well, if you look at this, and you look at the influence that he had upon these two individuals. You look at the influence upon Paul, you look at the influence upon uh, John Mark, and it's, and it's radical. Let's look at the contributions of these two men. And I think you can trace at least a part of that back to the fact that there was one there who saw good in them, who encouraged them, despite their weaknesses and shortcomings. Paul <clears throat> is a great missionary. He goes on three missionary journeys. He goes with Barnabas here. He goes on a second journey. And uh, he, uh, on that journey, you had this division 
between Barnabas and Paul over John Mark. And Barnabas wants to take John Mark again. And Paul says, no, you get one shot with Paul. That's it. You know. And so they divide up, and it turns out to, to work pretty well. Because Barnabas and John Mark go to Cyprus, and there is Paul taking Silas and going back across, strengthening the churches found on the first trip, and then crossing over into Europe and establishing churches at Philippi and uh, Thessalonica and Berea and Corinth. And then on the third journey, he goes back and he works uh, in Ephesus on the Aegean shore. And finally, <clears throat> he's arrested and sent to Rome, and there he is uh, in prison, house arrest, and I'm sure he's proclaiming the gospel there. Probably was executed for the faith. And you look at that, and here is this great missionary who spread the boundaries of, of, of Christianity so far and over into Europe. Also, he was a great writer. He wrote letters. And depending on who you're reading, he, he, he was the author by their 10 or 13 letters that made their way into the New Testament. And you look at that, and much of the theology that we have today, and one of the songs that we sing, it mentioned basically justification by faith. The heart and soul of the gospel. And here was one who was such a legalist, emphasizing the law, and suddenly, clearer than any other writer, I think, in the New Testament, he realized we are justified before God on faith and faith alone, period. And not our own righteousness. Powerful. And so all of these things come our way, and how many times we have studied, you know, the writings of Paul. And I say, he's there in part, and I think major part, because one man believed in him, and stood with him, <clears throat> and worked with him. <clears throat> and John Mark, <clears throat> John Mark, I, I, I like it. it. I think his gospel is the earliest gospel. Uh, most biblical scholars, I think, agree with that. And you look at John Mark's journey. And here was a young man, and he gets to go, and he works with these two great missionaries. And he goes home early, and he comes back, and, and Paul says, no way. Couldn't trust you anymore. But Barnabas says, come on, go with me, and we'll go back there. He had confidence, not only just because of the relative thing, because of the nephew thing. But he had confidence. Again, he saw not only hope, but potential in this young man. And somehow, we don't know how, but later on, he becomes, John Mark becomes an associate with Simon Peter. Becomes his secretary, his amanuensis. And he hears all this preaching and all these sermons, you know, and if you'd rather have me preaching from the New Testament or hearing Peter say, let me tell you about the time by the Sea of Galilee. Let me about tell you about the time in Gethsemane when I was hum humbled and broken and fled when I should have stood with Jesus. Let me tell you about these other things. Let me tell you about when Jesus, after the Last Supper, said, you all are going to go astray, you know, you're going to flee. And he looked at me and said, when you have turned, strengthen me, after Jesus had predicted he was going to deny him. And you look at this and he hears all of these wonderful stories. <clears throat> and there reaches a time in the church when a couple things are happening. The eyewitnesses to the living Lord are dying off. Who's going to tell the stories now? How are you going to teach them? And their witness, their testimony needed to be recorded. And it was John Mark that wound up recording that. It was John Mark that put that first gospel into place. And probably later on it was Matthew and Luke who used John Mark and then filled in with a whole lot of more things. A lot more information. <clears throat> and I look at this and I think of the testimony of John Mark and I say, a lot of that has to do because his uncle Barnabas saw the good in him and not his youthfulness, not his shortcomings, not his failures. And so I say as we look at, at Barnabas this morning, <clears throat> he gives us a model. And I will say to you honestly, if there's someone I would like to, like to model my Christian life after, it's Barnabas. I like Paul, but he and I wouldn't be best buddies because <laughs> we just have a different perspective on life. But I appreciate everything he said and everything he did and everything that he wrote. <clears throat> but I look at Barnabas and I know that I can see the good in people. Let me close with, with a story. My wife and I, Janice and I, retired and moved to Denver uh, back in 2001. We became members of First Baptist Church. We weren't too far from there. We could walk there if we wanted to. It was about a 40, 45 minute walk. But, uh, in First Baptist Church, uh, the oldest continuing Baptist Church in the state of uh, Colorado. <clears throat> and it had a wonderful location. But it was, like many First Baptist churches, it was declining. Times had changed. And the wealthy base had disappeared and it was a struggling situation. 
And I ask myself time and again, how in the world can we communicate the gospel in this, wor in this world in which we live? And one Sunday morning before church, I, went, I, I stood on the, uh, the front porch, we would say, the front of the church, and I looked out right across the street was uh, the, the state capitol, directly across the street. I looked down across the park in front of the capitol, and there, across that park, were the uh, business offices, of the offices of, of, the state, of the county government and the city government of Denver. Just right down the street from us, on the same side, was the Supreme Court of the state of Colorado. One block over, there was the Colorado uh, Historical Museum, the Colorado Baptist Historical Society. Across the street from that was the library with all the knowledge there. And just down from there, there was the Denver Art Museum. The, and that, the uh, ac acronym for that is very interesting for the Denver Art Museum. Anyway, if you went down a few blocks, you were on the 16th Street Mall. And this was, they had a free shuttle going there. And you had the filthy rich and the, and the uh, filthy poor rubbing rubbing elbows side by side. And you could walk uh, to uh, the baseball park, Coors Field. You could go to the Pepsi Center where they played big league sports and basketball and hockey. And Vesco Field uh, uh, was there that had replaced Mile High Stadium. Uh, we won't mention uh, the Denver Broncos this morning, uh, uh, although you probably would enjoy that very much. But yeah, right. That's why I don't mention them. I'm very careful. I'm a quick study, you know. But I look at this, and this was a strange world. A lot going on. People going their own way. Poverty and wealth and its problems, greed, politics and battles and struggles. And it would be easy to look out and say, how do we communicate these people? And I could have easily started pointing out all the problems and all the flaws with that modern society that was there. But I looked out and said, one of the ways we have to do it we have to look out and find ways to see the good in this world that is about us. There is good in those people. There was good in the politicians. There was good in the businessmen. There were good in the athletes. There were good, you know, in the art community. And I think that if somehow, some way, we are going to communicate the gospel right here in this community, we need to look out and find and see and affirm the good in the people that are around us. You can point out the bad. And I also really realized one thing that I think was just as important. If you see the good in people, they'll see the good in you. And if you see the negative or the bad, guess what they're going to see in you? You don't have to have a college degree to figure that one out. They'll see the negative and the shortcomings that you have. And so I think in this day and time, the church needs to take a deep breath and step back and look at Barnabas and see who he was and see this wonderful quality of seeing the good. And I would also add to that doing the good. And look at how can we communicate here in this community and that's the great starting point. And I think as we come together this morning, you know, there's a pretty good reason and it's expressed in the songs that we, we say, see. When it's all said and done, this miserable human race, which we are at times, God saw the good in us. Saw so much good that he was willing to send his son live, to die, raised, uh, raised again. And I look at that and I think that this is such a simple quality and characteristic that Barnabas leaves us with. Seeing the good. I hope when you go out and you start to evaluate that sermon today, yeah, I see the good points in it. Where I stumble over my words, fouled up, don't worry about that. It's just a part of being human. Seeing the good and doing the good is at the heart of proclaiming the good news that we have from Jesus Christ. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, you're humbled this morning by your grace, your mercy, when we don't deserve it. And Father, we're so grateful that you see the good in us, and we know this through your love and through your prayer. We pray, Father, that for this church and this congregation, that as you look upon us, you will see the good in us and you will affirm it and we will know of your affirmation. And that we will go forth and look at the people about us and find the good and affirm the good and uplift the good. And we know, Father, that they will look at us and see the goodness in us and hopefully that they can trace it back to you. Help us to be your people. Help us to see the good and help us to do the good wherever we find ourselves in Jesus' name. <clears throat>